my friend was pointing out earlier the beauty of the flowers, the beauty of the snowdrops. Do you see the snowdrops down there? They are beautiful flowers. And the snowdrops show us that spring is approaching. And then you get the crocuses and then the daffodils and everything bursts forth into life. Well, I want to read to you today of the resurrection of the dead because our Lord Jesus Christ came into this world to overcome death, to destroy death and to deliver up all his people to give them eternal life that they might have a hope in heaven. Now when you plant a snowdrop, you plant a little bulb and then it grows into a flower and you don't see what the flower is like until the spring and then you see the snowdrop we're talking about the snowdrops there and how the snowdrops are a sign of the spring coming of life coming the buds on the trees are a sign that life is coming and so Jesus Christ when he came into this world he came to rise from the dead and he is the first fruit of them that slept. You see, immediately you mention Jesus Christ, they walk away. Away. Why do they do that? Why do they do that? When we are told in the Holy Bible that by man came death and by man came the resurrection of the dead. Spring speaks of resurrection. After winter, after the cold and icy weather, and believe you me, I don't like the cold. Some of you say, you came from hot countries. Well, I came from a hot country. I came from East Africa in 1961, and it was one of the coldest winters on record. And I wish I'd gone back to Africa, because it's a nice warm country. But you see, after winter comes spring, and after spring comes summer. And so the buds on the trees are showing us that summer is approaching. Just as when Israel became a nation again, it shows us that the Lord Jesus Christ is coming. Because we're told in the Holy Bible that when you see the spring, when you see the fig tree putting forth her leaves, you know that summer is coming. Summer is near. Summer is approaching. And so when Israel became a nation again, you know that the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ is drawing near. And as we have that in the Bible, all the way through the Old Testament of the Bible, we are told that the Gentiles, the other nations of the world, the non-Jewish nations, must come to salvation before Jesus Christ brings his own people back to himself. So we look forward to the salvation of the Jew. And that is why Paul, the apostle, was very jealous for his own people's salvation. He said, my heart is overwhelmed. I can wish myself accursed for my people, the children of Israel. And he longed to see the gospel fully preached to all the nations of the world and so that Jesus Christ might save his own people. And that's why he called himself the apostle to the Gentiles. And in the writing of the Apostle Paul concerning the resurrection of the dead, he says this about the body or the plant that is planted. This is what he says concerning the resurrection of the dead. He says this, If Christ be not raised, your faith is vain, ye are yet in your sins. Then they also which have fallen asleep in Christ are perished. If in this life only we have hope in Christ, we are of all men most miserable. But now is Christ risen from the dead and become the first fruits of them that slept. For since by man came death, by man came also the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all die, even so in Christ shall all be made alive. 
And so here we are told of why death came into the world. He came into the world because of sin. God said to our first parents, Adam and Eve, in the day you eat of the tree of knowledge of good and evil, you will surely die. And so God said, the soul that sins, it shall die. And so death came into the world because of man's sin, because of disobedience to the word of God. And the first thing that the devil did when he questioned God, he said, yea, has God said? So every time the devil would try and undermine the kingdom of God, he questions the word of God. He questions the Holy Bible. The Holy Bible, the Old and New Testaments of the Bible are the word of God. And the devil comes, the father of lies, the one who lied to our first parents, the devil said, yea, hath God said? And then he contradicted God. God had said, you'll surely die. The devil said, you will not surely die. So you see why they argue. Why do they argue with the word of God? Because they're of their father, the devil. And they even... I beg your pardon. Just a question. Can you describe the, what happened at the Transfiguration? What, is, what was going on there? The Transfiguration. Yeah. I, just, I don't understand. What is that like a mini resurrection or something? Or? This man has asked a question and it fits in with what I'm saying. I hope it does. Because, I'll tell you why it does. Because Jesus Christ is the eternal word of God. The, the Mohammedans say the Kalimatullah. He's the eternal word of God. So when Moses and Elijah appeared with him on the Mount of Transfiguration, it was an eternal moment in time. It was God stepping into time to show for the glory of Christ, that Christ is the eternal son. And so when Moses was alive there on the Holy Mount, Elijah was alive there with Jesus Christ. And the three disciples, Peter, James, and John, they saw the Lord Jesus glorified, brighter than the sun in all its strength. His raiment shone like the light. So he was and glorified before his resurrection. He is the glorified Son of God. The reason why he came into this world, he came into this world as man to destroy death. Because death, we're told in 1 Corinthians 15, where I was reading, that by man came death. Since by man came death, by man came also the resurrection of the dead. So the eternal life, Jesus Christ, the eternal life was veiled in this humanity. And he came into the world as man to reveal God to us. We couldn't see God. God is so pure and holy, infinitely holy, that man cannot see God and live. And that's why Jesus Christ came veiled in flesh. And that is why the Apostle Paul writing to Timothy said that God was manifest in the flesh. God was manifest in the flesh. That means God was revealed in the flesh. And, and the Mohammedans, when they question the deity of Christ, when they question whether Jesus Christ is God, what they don't understand is the necessity of the humanity of Christ to put away death. He has to come into the world as man to suffer the penalty for death, for sin, which is death, by his own death on the cross. He has to go through that suffering and that penalty. And when Jesus Christ suffered death, it was not just physical death. He was suffering spiritual death because he was going to that place of separation. My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? He was going through spiritual death and he was suffering the damnation of hell on the cross. So there was an eternal death and only he could suffer it because he's the eternal son of God. Had he just been a prophet, had he just been a man, he could never have suffered all the righteous anger of an infinitely holy God against sin. And he did that, he was willing to do that out of love for sinners like you and I. That's why he was willing to go through the excruciating agony of separation from the Father. 
when he said, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? He was enduring the curse of sin, which was death. He was enduring that thing that we could not bear. And if we die without Christ, we're going to have to suffer endlessly in hell, everlasting torment. It's eternal punishment. And people don't understand this, that this world is all there is. We've all only got this time, this breath now. Don't waste it on tobacco and things like that. But the breath that we have now, we'll never have again. And one day, the dust will return to the earth as it was, and the spirit or the breath will return to the God who gave it. Our breath is not just steam going up into the atmosphere. Our breath is because we are made in the divine image. Because God breathed into our first father, Adam, the breath of life. God breathed that divine image into Adam. And man has fallen from that divine image because sin has marred the clay, as it were. God is the potter and we are the clay. And sin has marred that image of God in man. And so Jesus Christ came to die for our sins and then to rise again to swallow up death so that we might say, O oh, death, where is thy sting? O oh, grave, where is thy victory? And that is why Jesus Christ has swallowed up death. Spirit going to heaven. Uh, it's, it's but with, spirit, with uh, no, Paul, it's, it's, it's like uh, with Paul, it's like we have a new, a new body, a new clothing, a new, a new spiritual body. Yes, so, Jesus Christ, Jesus Christ rose spirit. in the very body that he'd lived in. Yeah. The reason why he was unrecognizable and we shouldn't make pictures of Jesus Christ is because when he appeared to the disciples after he was risen from the dead, their eyes were holding that they couldn't see him, they couldn't recognize him, because he had this resurrection body. It was the same body. But we're told in Isaiah 52 that his visage, his face, was more marred than any man, and his form more than the sons of men. That's why he was unrecognizable in his human body, because he was so wounded and bruised and battered. And he went through all that out of love for the human race to redeem us from all iniquity. And since Christ, God in Christ, paid such a great price for our sin, that's why we should surrender our whole lives to him. Because there is nothing more precious than knowing the Son of God who loved us and gave himself for us. And so on the Mount of Transfiguration, when Jesus Christ, he was there in his humanity, but in a divine moment, he appeared with Moses and Elijah, and they appeared with him in glory. And so Moses and Elijah were alive. They were alive, they're alive today. When at the burning bush, God said to Moses, I am the God of Abraham, I am the God of Isaac, I am the God of Jacob, he's the God of the living. He's the God of the living because all live unto him. And so once a person is born again of the Spirit of God, he's brought alive. And when the Holy Spirit gives you the new birth, you are made alive. You'll never die again. Yes, your body might go to rest in the grave, in the tomb, but the... The spiritual body of St. Paul talks about. The being, body, the body will go a... back to the earth as it was. Right. And the spirit will return to the God who gave it. But on the day of Jesus Christ's return to this world, he is coming in glory. And all those who have died in Christ, all those who died with faith in Jesus Christ, he will bring with him. And all those who are alive when he comes again will be caught up together with them in the, in the air to meet the Lord in the air. Caught up in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. When he comes again, all his people will be like a magnet. They'll be drawn up to him. And they will have glorified bodies. Not just these bodies, but glorified bodies like the Lord Jesus Christ's glorified body. And that's why he showed a manifestation of his glory at the Mount of Transfiguration when he appeared with Moses and Elijah. And so they could see that this is the Lord of glory. And Simon Peter, in his ignorance, said, shall we make three tabernacles? Shall we make three tents? One for you, one for Moses, one for Elijah. Not realizing what he said. 
because Peter was seeing a divine moment of the glory of Christ in time. And this was why Jesus took only uh, Peter, James and John up into the Mount of Transfiguration to give them a glimpse of his glory. And he said, don't tell any man about this until after I'm risen from the dead. And that's why Peter, in his first letter, and also in his second letter, he says, I was an eyewitness of his majesty when on that holy Mount of Transfiguration there came such a voice to him from the excellent glory saying, this is my beloved son. God is saying, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. Hear him. And Peter was ready to, he was wanted to speak. He wanted to speak. But God said, hear him. Don't try and utter words. Sorry, one Peter. Did he? Two Peter chapter one. Two Peter chapter one. Two Peter chapter one. Right, two Peter chapter one. Thank you. The second letter of Peter chapter one. And he says, we were eyewitnesses of his majesty. When there came to him this voice from the excellent glory, this is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. Hear him. So we are to hear Jesus Christ. The words of Jesus Christ are most important because God told Moses, I'm going to raise you up a prophet and I'm going to put my words in his mouth and everyone that does not hear the words of that prophet, I will require it of him. And Jesus Christ said, the words that I speak to you are not mine, but the fathers that sent me. And so the words of Christ are from the Father because he is that prophet so that God father? said he would father? raise up. We can't see. see. If you've been here a few minutes ago, you'd, you'd, you'd hear. You cannot see the Father and live. Je Jesus Christ said, He that has seen me has seen the Father. That is by faith. Because all that is in God the Father is in God the Son. All the attributes of the Father are in the Son. He is the eternal Word. The, in the beginning, in the beginning, was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God, and the, pro the prophet, no it wasn't the same, no Christ is not a created being. In Isaiah chapter 44 and verse 6 we're told, thus saith the Lord, the King of Israel, and his Redeemer, the Lord of hosts, I am the first, and I am the last, and beside me there is no God. So Jesus Christ made it clear that he is the first and he is the last. He is the redeemer of his people because he's redeemed them by shedding his own blood. And without shedding of blood is no redemption. We can only be redeemed from our sin by the blood, the shed blood of Jesus Christ. There's no other atonement for sin but the blood. And that's why God said to Moses, I have given you the blood. It's the life of the flesh is in the blood. You have no blood, you have no life. The life of the flesh is in the blood and I've given it to you. You've got blood, yes. But I've given it, I've given you the blood upon your altar to make an atonement. Not the, not the blood of animals. I've given you the blood. What blood is he talking about? He's to, no, he's not. He's talking about Christ's blood. The blood of God. The blood of God. The blood of, it's the blood of God. Paul, Paul the Apostle, when he was saying good... No, listen, listen. Instead of arguing, you should listen. And then you'll learn. If you want to argue, then go and argue somewhere else. But when Jesus... No, you, 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 you want to argue. You don't want to answer to your question. You want to stay blind, Charles. That's the problem. So which is you want to stay blind? Yes. The problem is you're saying I'm blind and everybody's blind like me. I'm Nobody can in. see. I'm and that's why you need to have your eyes open to the truth. Well, where is Jesus now? And what I was saying was that the life of the flesh is in the blood. And God said to Moses, I have given it to you, the blood that is, upon your altar to make an atonement. For it is the blood that makes atonement for the soul. Not the blood of animals, because the blood of animals can never take away human sin. But it was the blood of the Lamb of God, Jesus Christ. And Jesus Christ is the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. 
That's why you need the blood of Jesus Christ. You need the blood of Jesus Christ to cleanse you from all sin. And so God has spoken. And God has given us atonement. And the atonement for our sin is in Jesus Christ, who said, I am the first. And I am the last. And in Isaiah, when God says, I am the first and I'm the last and there's no other God beside me, Jesus Christ declared that to be the first and the last, to be the Alpha and the Omega, which are the first and the last letters of the Greek alphabet. And what you need is, you may need Omega 3 for your body, but you need Jesus, the Omega. No, you don't. The last, the first and the last. The Alpha and the Omega, the beginning him. and the ending. You don't know because you've never had him. No, you you've him. never known him. So you don't know. You so don't you say you him. don't need him. Don't yes, you do need him. Brilliant. Without Jesus Christ, Brilliant. there is don't no life. Him. Only in Jesus Christ do we have eternal life, yeah. everlasting life. That's not true. And we will not come into condemnation, but are passed from death to life. This is because Jesus Christ said, I am the resurrection. I am the life. He that believes in me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. So what is and he now? that liveth so and believeth in me shall story. never die. And that is why, why not a story. It's God's story. story. It's his blood, blood, story. Blood, 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 blood. History is what God has revealed about himself. Blood, blood, blood. And only in Jesus Christ will you come to know God personally as your Savior and your Lord and your it's King. Peace, Only in Jesus no, Christ you will your you sin God. be forgiven. Yeah, Only through Jesus God. Christ God. will you know God. that your sin God. has been pardoned, God. that your God. sin God. has God. been covered. You could save Only in Jesus <laughs> Christ will you know you the forgiveness of your sin, God. the assurance that your sin is forgiven. Only in Jesus Christ can you be assured that your sin has been put away? Only in Jesus Christ can you be sure that your sin has been removed as far as the east is from the west. God said, I have brought it out as a thick cloud thy transgression and will not remember thy sins. And this is what God does with his people's sin. He pardons sin, all sin. The worst of no, sin, no, the greatest of sinners, sin? the Why? greatest Why? of sinners who comes to Jesus Christ. And you have to come to him. You have to come to him. A broken spirit and a contrite heart. You see, a lot of people, they come to God and they bring up the sins of others. And if you look at other people's sins, instead of confessing your own sin, you will not be forgiven. Our Lord told Simon Peter how many times he should forgive. And he said, 70 times 7. Peter uh -huh. said, how oh, often does my brother sin against me and I forgive him until seven times? He said, no, I'm not saying that until you, until seven times. I say until 70 times seven. And that means infinitesimal sins. That's why we have to be forgiven our sins. He can't save me, don't believe him. Only the blood of Jesus Christ can wash away your sin. And instead of pointing a finger at the sins of others, what about your own sin? Instead of pointing a finger at other 